Well, welcome everybody, and thank you for joining our breast best practices transition assessments with Dr. Anderson. Dr. Anderson has over 40 years of experience teaching special education in the, in the middle and high school levels, as well as in higher education, adult education, and consulting with the community, adult service, and employment agencies. She was previously the um, transition coordinator, which was a joint position between the Connecticut State Department of Education, Bureau of Special Education, and the Department of Rehabilitation Services. So Pat has a lot of experience and we welcome her to this evening to discuss transition assessments. Thank you, Pat. Hi, welcome to everybody. I'm happy to be here. Um, you want me to, did you share the screen? or I can share the, oh, screen now. share the screen. Just really quickly, I just wanna make sure that everybody understands that this is being recorded. We are on Facebook Live, so just keep that in mind. We are not sharing any stories, or if you have any questions, we are gonna hold questions unless it's a clarifying questions so until the end. But if you do have a clarifying question, just please um, raise your hand. And Millennia will give the instructions in Spanish and also put that in the chat. Hola, bienvenidos a todos. Estas son las instrucciones. And, um, do you want to just tell them if that you put the revised PowerPoint? Yes, I'll put that into the chat. All right. So um, we sent out the original PowerPoint. I just tweaked it a little bit and added some new resources. So it will be in the chat room and also reposted. But for the most part, it will be pretty much the same. So tonight we're going to be talking about understanding transition assessment for students with disabilities. Um, there's way more information here than I can cover in an hour, so I will skip through some slides very quickly, but you'll have it to refer back to. So when we're talking about trans transition assessment, we, we have to set the framework under IDEA, uh, which covers secondary transition, um, which covers students ages 15 to 22. Um, tr secondary transition is a coordinated set of activities it's results-oriented process. It includes both academic and functional achievement, which means what a student can do. And it facilitates them, their movement from school to post-school activities. The three primary areas are post-secondary education and training, employment and independent living. But as you will see, it encompasses much more than those three areas. So it starts not later than the first IEP to be in effect when a child turns 16 or in Connecticut, it's 14 for students who are on the autism spectrum. It has to be updated annually thereafter. So if you're looking at transition goals and objectives that look the same year after year after year, it's not being updated annually. There also must be evidence that the student is invited to the PPT meeting, which we strongly encourage. That's part of being an adult, is attending meetings, and that evidence uh, is available that you invited an outside agency or representative to attend, or at least you considered that. So those are all the requirements of secondary transition. But this is the key part. Anything that's important tonight, I highlighted in green for you. Um, so in the IEP, when we're talking about transition assessment, the measurable post-secondary goals, which frame what a child is aiming for after high school, must be based upon age-appropriate transition assessments. If you leave with nothing else, leave with this phrase, because most school districts don't do a good job with this piece of the IEP. They do assessments and they write goals, but they're not usually based on the assessments that they do. So we're gonna be trying to connect those dots a little bit tonight. Um, they have to include annual goals related to uh, the, three area, the two areas, post-secondary post education or training and employment, and if appropriate, independent living skills, and they have to also include transition services uh, and a course of study to help the student reach those bigger post-secondary post goals. Oops. So I want you to take a look at this research summary slide. These are what, what I like to call the keys to success for transition. 
and they're based on research by Paula Kohler in, in secondary transition. And if you take a look at these skill areas or these keys, these are all things that can be worked on at home, can be worked on in school, and can be worked on when a child is preschool age or 22. So I want you to keep in mind that all legally transition assessment and transition goals and objectives don't have to be in an IEP until a student turns 16 or 14 if they're on the autism spectrum. It can happen earlier if the PPT decides that, but more importantly, transition is something you should be thinking about at a very early age for all students, especially students who have disabilities. So that's the other piece that I'm gonna talk about today. And you see the word I've highlighted here tonight is independent. If a child cannot be independent, they will not be able to go off to school by themselves, go to work by themselves, get around in the community by themselves. So the most important assessment area for any children is independence in any skill area. So let's define transition assessment. It's an ongoing process. There's another key phrase for you. It doesn't happen once or twice or once a year. Of collecting data on an individual's strengths, needs, preferences, and interests. And some districts think it's just preferences and interests, but it's not. Um, as they relate to future working demands, education, living, personal, and social environments. So you see already we're expanding assessment beyond just post-secondary education, training and employment and independent living. So this assessment data is the thread that ties the transition process together and defines the goals and objectives that the student's going to be working on. So it's very key. So before we go on to some of the transition areas, I, I wanna share a brief scenario with you that I hope will tie some of these things together that I've been highlighting in green. Um, if you had a student that enters school from another district, and let's say he was going into a math class, the first thing this teacher would do would be to assess the math skills of that student and then develop instruction on the areas that the student needed to work on. And then at the end of the year, they would test them again to see if they mastered those areas and what are the new areas that need to be worked on. Same thing in reading, same thing in writing, same thing in spelling. It should be the same thing in transition. The problem is transition is a much bigger process and includes many more areas. And there aren't as many paper pencil tests for all of the areas in transition. So sometimes we have to be a little more informal and a little more creative when it comes to assessing where a student is in some of the transition goals. And that's what makes it a little confusing both for you as families and for districts who may not know how or what to assess uh, or what to assess with. So this is a uh, diagram of the, uh, the uh, transition process. And I'm not gonna go through it in great detail, but you can see at the very top, we have that age appropriate transition assessments and everything else, the goals, the needs, strengths, interests, and preferences, the post-school outcome goal statements, everything is based on that assessment data. And this is a process that students need to learn. They will go through many, many times in their lifetime. It may not look the same as it does in school, but all of you go through a process every time you switch jobs, every time you buy a new house, every time you make a new change in your life, um, you go through a process. And that's kind of what we're trying to teach um, students who are on an IEP. So what transition assessment is, it should be the first step in transition planning. Um, 
it should be individualized and recent within the current year um, because you're basing the current year's goals and objectives on that transition assessment, hopefully. Um, it should be an ongoing process that starts at an early age, which may start with you as the family or the parents um, and not necessarily the school. It should be comprehensive and cumulative and spans multiple years and settings. But what you're going to see in the IEP may just be that current assessment and the current data. So one of the things you can check with the school is, is if they keep track of all the transition assessments that they've done with a student over time, and it's often in a different place. It might be a, on a portfolio, it might be on a separate plan, it might just be in a file somewhere. <clears throat> so it should be based on the student's strengths, preference, interest and transition needs, which is what's in IDEA, but that shouldn't be all that is assessed. Um, it informs the development of what we call the post-school outcome goals. And I don't have time to go into what all of that is, but those are the big, what do, what do you wanna do after high school goals? I wanna attend college, I wanna work competitively, I wanna live on my own. Those are the kinds of post-school outcome goals that, that we're talking about. The annual goals is what's written on pages seven of your IEP. And then the objectives are there, and those are often the transition services, the actual activities that um, <clears throat> the student will go through to reach their annual goals and then their post-school outcomes. The other piece that's key with any kind of assessment is you need some type of assessment to identify what needs to be addressed and then to develop the goals, but you also need a version of that assessment to determine if the student has met the goals that you've been working on for the year. So it also monitors progress. And it could be the same assessment tool. What transition assessment is not, it's not just done once a year. It's not only a paper pencil test. It's not the same assessment for every student. It should be individualized. And it shouldn't be just completed before the draft goals for the IEP are developed for transition information. It's not just a special education teacher's responsibility and it shouldn't just address interests or preferences. So you can see we're painting a bigger and bigger and bigger picture. So this is just one way of looking at some of the key areas in transition and some of the subsections here. And I'm not gonna go through and read this, but you can see the vast number of areas that we could write a transition goal on any one of these areas, depending on what the PPT determines is a priority for the student. So I'm showing you this because one of the roles of the family is going to be to help collect some of this transition assessment data. So I'm gonna share with you what we call a five question strategy and I've added a six question. So what do we already know about the student in relation to transition or a particular area that you're gonna create a goal in? It might be transportation. It might be making lunch. Okay, so whatever it is, what do we already know? What do we need to learn about the student? How are we going to gather that information? So how are we going to assess that information? Who's going to do it? And when will the information be gathered? And then my question I added is, and what are we going to do with that information? So that's kind of what I'm going to answer for the rest of the presentation. So I'm going to share with you now something called the Transition Assessment Planning Form that was developed by the Transition Coalition. It's something we use. Uh, can share with districts to use, but it's something the family could use. Um, and the areas, the questions I covered are up at the top, except what, we're, what are we gonna do with this information? Um, so you can just fill in what you already know about your child or the student you're working with in these areas. So this is current and future employment, 
We have education or training and we have independent living areas on that page and then on the next page. And you of course can add in other areas as, as you see fit. But this will give you an idea of what are you seeing at home? What are you seeing when your child goes out in the community or participates in other activities? Um, you could have a coach fill this out if your child plays sports, for example, or participates in an art or a music program. So this is just an informal way, although you can put in here formal assessments that have been done um, in the various places. This I borrowed from CERC. CERC has put together a brand new uh, transition assessment module that's available for people to go through. And I picked this slide and one others because they're so colorful. But these are some of the key areas that we would be assessing for students in transition from career and employment. You have communication, self-determination, health, community participation, relationships, recreation and leisure. And I suspect those of you who are already involved in transition are saying, nobody in my district is looking at recreation and leisure and nobody is looking at communication and maybe community participation. So it's going to vary from student to student what you're going to assess. You don't have to assess all of these areas, but these are areas that are critical to transition. And then we have other areas like special interests and skills, physical mobility, sensory needs. Assistive technology is a huge one, and I'll get a little bit more into that, and certainly preferences and interests. But preferences and interests alone is not going to get a student a job. So the next couple of slides highlight briefly um, some of the categories of the types of things that could be used for transition assessment. But in reality, transition assessment could be almost anything. So one of the most important things is to review the student's file, both their educational file and their special education file see what information is in there that can give you uh, a clue about what they need or what they can do in terms of their transition goals. One of my favorite sayings is to look at everything that happens with a child at any age, but particularly in high school, through a transition lens. And what that means is look at other assessments that have been done. So maybe you had a child go through a an adaptive functioning assessment, which DDF, DDS often uses to determine eligibility uh, for their services, but a student who's gonna go on to a job has to, has to have adaptive functioning skills and abilities. So what, does, what do the results of that test mean in terms of the student's transition goals? Same thing with OT or PT, or speech and language evaluations, um, any kind of academic testing. There are very few jobs that don't require some level of reading, writing, or math. So knowing the levels of the student and what they can do in the academic areas can be um, transition information, can be a transition assessment. That's where we get into what we call the academic and the functional performance. So if we were talking about reading, you could tell me your child who is in sixth grade reads at a third grade level. I'm an employer. I have no idea what that means. I have no idea what third grade reading level means. So the functional part of reading might be the student needs to read it and hear it at the same time, or the student needs to say it out loud in order to be able to understand it or the student needs to take longer to read it than most people. That's the functional part of the academics that's more appropriate for transition goals and objectives. Student and family interviews are huge when you're talking about assessment. And in fact, when a stu student first starts with transition goals and objectives in an IEP, a student interview is usually one of the first assessments that we do, just talking to the student and see what they wanna do after high school. And many of them will say, I don't know, 
which is you at least know where you have to start with them. And so you start with interest inventories and preferences and have them explore things, see what they like, see what they don't like, toss things out, explore things further. So that's part of the whole transition process. The piece we often forget is interviewing family and other people that are associated with the student because they may see things that the student doesn't see. And so that can be very helpful information as well. Interest inventories, um, the school counselors often do interest inventories when they work with all students. There are many interest inventories that are done, but that is not the only transition assessment. And once you have a transition, once you have an interest inventory, if you don't use the results, what's the sense in doing another one? So there are some students that they do an interest inventory every year. And if their interests aren't going to change, um, there's no sense in doing another one. So usually in most interest inventories, you will come up with two or three different areas that the student can explore. You may have to do it a second time, um, maybe a year or two down the road, if everything the student identified in the first in interest inventory doesn't pan out, um, but it shouldn't be an annual test. Person-centered planning, um, there's a whole slide at the end that has links to a variety of person-centered planning resources. It's a more involved type of assessment, can take up to a couple of hours. Usually it involves a group of people, but it gives the student a little more um, empowerment to take charge of what they want and what they don't want. They can bring in outside people, family members, as well as school people into these meetings. And it really looks at what the student wants and the steps that it might take to get there. So person-centered planning is one great transition assessment and there are many different types. For students in particular who are going on to further education, whether it's college or a technical program. Um, we have study skills and learning style inventories and there are a number of those that can be done. Um, also looking at um, executive functioning skills, organizational abilities. And then you have the behavior, behavioral aspects of transition, social skills, behavior rating skills, um, because you have behavior, certain behaviors that have to happen on the job, certain behaviors that have to happen on a college campus and so forth. So these are all transition assessments. Then you can have um, informal assessments, which could be a simple checklist. It could be a rubric. Um, it could be something that another related services person has developed. Then you also have standardized assessments. One of the ones that's most common is the ASFAB. They give that for students who are looking at going off to the um, military service, um, but they have other kinds of standardized assessments. Then there's one that I can't spend a lot of time on. There's a process called customized employment. And this is a more hands-on assessment method of of taking students who have more significant disabilities, but who could work in a competitive environment. Um, and their assessment component is called the discovery process. So it's just something if you wanna learn more about, I would look up customized employment and the discovery process is the assessment component of that particular process. And I believe, um, I was told that the Department of Education, the Bureau of Rehab Services and DDS are trying to put together a customized employment pilot project that hopefully will get started this summer. So hopefully you'll hear a little bit more about that in the days to come. And then finally, we have what we call a comprehensive vocational evaluation. And I'm gonna just mention here I often get questions both from families and from districts about who can do an independent educational evaluation, an IEE, in transition. My experience has been, unless the district has absolutely no idea 
how to use any of these other transition assessments or they're very off base with what the family thinks is to be going on with the student that often um, an outside evaluation in transition is not always as helpful as looking at what we already know about the student, doing some informal kinds of assessments and then picking more relevant goals. It's something that I'm, I'm sure in certain cir circumstances is warranted, but for the most part, um, these are things that people in districts can do. Um, and I'm gonna show you, it doesn't have to be just the special education people. So I mentioned to you before that I talk a little bit about assistive technology or technology in general. IDEA states that the PP10 members must develop in the development of IEPs consider whether a child needs assistive technology devices and services. And this is particularly important when it comes to transition, not only for a student who might be going off to a post-secondary learning environment and may need technology to help with reading or writing or study skills or organizational skills, but also for students who are going into employment who might find it easier to use certain kinds of technology. This does not necessarily mean an AT evaluation, but it should be looking at low tech, could be something like just using a highlighter, could be using flashcards or apps. There are a ton of apps out there. And I happen to be working with a student right now. And one of this student's goals in study skills is learning how to know when to ask for help on assignments getting her assignments done and turned in on time. And, but the one piece that was missing is they weren't giving the student a tool where she could do this on her own. So we're trying to find an app that she can use on her phone or an iPad that will help her remind her when she has to turn in an assignment and does she have everything in her backpack that's ready to turn in the next day and that type of thing. And that goes back to that one green word I highlighted for you earlier, independence, okay? If a student always needs prompting to get work in, to get to things on time, to remember certain strategies, they are not going to be successful after high school because we don't have prompting in employment. We don't have prompting in college. Students need to learn to be independent wherever possible. All right, so here is the one that talks about what will we do with this information. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the IEP and, and there is a uh, slide that has the IEP on it and, in a few pages, but when you go into a PPT meeting and you're looking at transition assessment, the first thing you need to look at is on page six, number three, which is that where they list the transition assessments that have been done to develop the transition goals and objectives in that particular IEP. And the only one that should be there, the only ones that should be there are the ones they use for the current IEP. And sometimes a district will list every single transition assessment they've ever done. Um, so you just wanna know what did they use to develop the current transition goals and objectives. The results of transition assessments, just like the results of any assessment, should go on pages four and five of the IEP, present levels of performance. And we're gonna, I'm gonna show you where that should go and what it might look like. One of the things to consider is that transition assessment data should be coordinated with any services your child might be getting or going to apply for with a state agency like BRS, Level Up, we are of Education and Services for the Blind, DDS, Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, DEMIS. The assessment data that a school district does, they do not have to do an assessment that determines eligibility for an adult service agency. 
or a college. So if a college says, I want uh, the student who has a learning disability to have an individualized IQ test, and the school district said, well, they had one in 10th grade, we're not going to do another one. Um, they don't have to because they don't have to determine the eligibility for the student getting into college or the st student being eligible for BRS. But they do have to do updated assessments to, to have the most recent information when the student graduates so that they know what services the student needs. So there's a difference between doing transition assessment that the agencies or the colleges want or what it's gonna tell them the services that the student still needs once they get to high school. So there is a difference there, but having it be coordinated is very helpful. So sometimes what happens when you have a child going off to college, if their triennial is going to be done in their junior year, they may do the minimal amount then and then really do it updated in their senior year so it's more current for the college to use in determining what kinds of services or accommodations that they need. So that's a good use of transition assessment and the timing of it. The last piece is that all of this assessment data should be in the summary of performance, either in the form itself or as an attachment. That's the document that every student who is on an IEP gets when they leave high school that summarizes what they've been working on, what their accommodations are, and the things that they still need to work on. So I don't have time to go into the summary of performance, but you can find that information on the State Department of Ed's website. But that's another place where we need to put this trans transition assessment data. And you won't find it there very often, but that's where it should be. So here is page six, the transition page of the IEP. Page uh, number three, where the green arrow is, is where the transition assessments should be listed. And then the next two pages are the present levels of performance um, pages. Now you have three different arrows because there's three different places you might find this transition assessment data. In the first column, you just can see the data. This is just an example of a student. So you see a lot of academic scores here, but it could also be listed under strengths and it could also be listed under needs and concerns if there's an area that you're gonna be working on and it has been assessed. And this also applies to the areas on page five including the vocational transition area. So the first column is just what is, it's the present levels of the student's performance, either academic or functional performance, or in this case, transition areas, or it could be listed as a strength or a concern and need. But if it's in the concern and need column, then we need to have an annual goal in that area. So there's three places that you might find the information here. But if you don't see any of that information, you can ask for the results of the assessment and that it be placed in the present levels of performance. Because this is the information that you use to develop goals and objectives. So I'm going pretty fast here. This is good. Um, so one of the things I want to do is highlight some of the techniques or questions that you as families and parents can ask about in your team. I will forewarn you that, as I said in the beginning, many districts do transition assessment and many of them are great transition assessments, but they don't always connect the transition assessments to the goals and objectives. And they certainly don't use transition assessment often to measure whether or not the student has mastered a goal or objective. So it's kind of letting you know that you may run into a little resistance when you start talking about this topic. But the other thing to highlight is that chart that we talked about. If you bring in some information and you see if the district might use that chart to see what they already have, 
you may find that you don't need a whole lot of new information to write more appropriate and individualized goals and objectives because it doesn't have to be a very extensive or expensive process. So again, make sure that there are current transition assessments on page six of the IEP. One of the things you wanna be cautious about is almost all students do some kind of interest inventory with their school counselor, usually in 10th grade. That should not be the only assessment that is on the transition page because it's a very superficial type of assessment and nobody usually even looks at the results. So it should be something that's a little bit more in depth. Make sure that the results of these assessments are on pages four and five. And if you don't see that, and this is the question to ask very tactfully, Ask the team if they can tell you the transition assessments that help them to determine the transition goals and objectives that they, they developed and what tools are they going to use to measure, measure the student's progress on those goals? Because that's the key here. Um, I won't deny that the goals and objectives that many districts write for students are certainly transition goals and objectives, but they're not necessarily based on the um, assessments that have been done. And they may not be the priority of the family or the student in terms of the objectives that the, the district is picking. You can also request input or implementation from related service providers, occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech and language, social workers, school psychologists, school counselors, those are all related service professionals. And OT in particular knows a lot about technology and accommodations that a student might need on a job or going off to college. Just like speech and language and social workers and school psychologists might know a lot about social skills and developing relationships and communication skills that are necessary in talking to faculty member at a college or employers or coworkers. So bringing in other areas then does take some of the weight off of special education and, and helps the whole school be involved in developing transition goals and objectives. So you might have a student who is working on uh, conversation skills in speech and language, but they're only addressing with peers in the high school. And you can add in one objective to talk about communication skills with adult superiors, adult managers, and that will be a transition goal and be very useful not only in high school, but when the student goes off to college or into an employment setting. So by adding in one transition objective to another transition area that a related service provider is working on is another way to tie everything the student's working on into that transition lens that we talked about earlier. You might share that transition assessment planning form that I shared with you that might be something that you filled out um, as a family, keeping track of information as you see things, think, oh, that's a skill they could use when they go off to work, or that's a skill they could use when they need to ask for directions or for assistance. Um, and share it with them, but also show them that this is a tool that they can use. Um, request the use of informal assessment tools to help refine goals or objectives. So very often we find that districts stick to the two areas that are required in the law, post-secondary education and training and employment, and they skip independent living. But my guess would be if you were to ask the special ed teachers, do they work on any independent living skills? The answer would be yes, they do. Because independent living skills is not just cooking, cleaning, doing your laundry and going grocery shopping. It could also be um, 
understanding your healthcare, transportation, um, being able to get up for work on time, um, crossing the street, accepting responsibility for feedback from your employer. All of those are independent living skills. And so it does help sometimes to have those areas explored and actually have a separate goal for the independent living skills. And when I get to the end, there's some resources that I'm gonna show you that have some, they might be a little bit older, but a lot of them are informal checklists that you can do at home and see what your son or daughter knows how to do already. And assessments don't, aren't to just identify what a student can't do. They're also important to identify what a student can do because that builds their self-confidence. If you have a checklist and, and everything is checked, no, you can't do it. I mean, that's very overwhelming and things like, I can't possibly learn all of this, th these things. But when you check off the things that they do know, and maybe there's more that they know than that they don't know, then that can be very empowering for a student who can have the self-confidence to see that they have some of the skills they're going to need to be successful after high school. So what they can do is probably as important, if not more important than what they can't do. And you also wanna make sure that your son or daughter are contributing to the areas of transition that they still wanna learn because it may not be on the school's agenda or the school's radar. So this is one of my favorite quotes that I wanna end with. When asking what is the time, the right time to begin transition planning, and in this case, starting with transition assessment, the answer should always be now, whatever age the child is. So I'm gonna take a minute to just show you what resources are at the end of this PowerPoint, and we will even have a few minutes left for questions. So this is my favorite page. Um, I, I strongly suggest each of these is linked. So you should be able to go right to the resource. Um, I think there's only one that I posted that um, I couldn't find the link to. These are some checklists and some articles that I found really helpful. And they talk about things that you can do with all of your children at home. Um, so I strongly encourage you to look at these. This is my favorite one, helping you develop soft skills for job success. Um, and it has a lot of great things that you can do that are fun. They're not just tasks that students have to learn. So I encourage you to look at these resources. And these are the person-centered planning resources that I talked about. Um, I think in Connecticut, we pretty much use maps, maybe path, and one of the ones we're using a lot more is called Charting the Life Course. It's a, a person-centered planning approach that DDS brought in from a, another state. And it's very simple to use. The kids love it. Um, and it's very helpful at helping them think about the future, which is very hard for, for kids to do, but certainly kids with disabilities to do. The next few slides are just some assessment resources um, there are a variety of toolkits and listings from different states. There might be a couple of videos in here. Um, these are certainly things that you can share with, with school districts, uh, either as a slide, share it electronically, or the actual item. So there's a couple of these. And this is one that I just found today, which is why I updated the PowerPoint. This is an online assessment to see if a student's abilities in an internship demands are a good match. And it's something that Project Search uses. It's a little more involved, you have to register for it, but I think it's free. I don't think it's something that you have to pay for, but um, I'm finding out all kinds of information as I was researching for this presentation. This QuickBook is an older book, but it has a lot of informal checklists that you might find helpful to use at home if you want to look into a particular area with your child or you want the school to look into it. So assessments don't have to be standardized tests. 
and they don't have to be big and long and involved. It can be a very simple checklist. So for example, you know that you want to, um, you wanna work on cooking skills with your student, but you have to know which cooking skills to work on. So a checklist might be a very easy way to kind of get an idea of what they can do already and what you need to focus on. Oops, I'm not gonna go there. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> I'm gonna stop sharing and then I'm gonna go back because I clicked on a link and I didn't mean to do that. Sorry. All right, let me just go forward here, see where I was. Come on. Technology. Oh, that's because I was at the end. Okay. So that's why, because I ended. All right, so I'm gonna stop here. Um, actually, let me stop sharing and we can go back and see everybody and I will just entertain any comments or questions that you have um, and we'll be done on time for you, Laura. <laughs> a lot of people chatted me asking for the PowerPoint. I know I was intermittently putting in, in into the chat, but several people came in late. So I'm going to post it in a few seconds and we will certainly email it to everyone as well. Are there any questions? Lots of things in the chat room. What's there? They're asking for the PowerPoint. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm going to post it again, so hopefully everybody will get it this time. Christina, I have a question. Go ahead. Yeah, my son is nine, so he's still young. But um, what could I be doing to plan for his bigger transitions to middle and high school now? All right, uh, you're breaking up a little bit, so I missed the beginning of your. I missed the beginning of your question. One more year before the transition to middle school. So he's in middle school now. After that, high school. So he's in middle school now. Did anybody get that? I got bits and pieces of it. Christine, if you want to put it in the Sorry. chat, maybe we can read it. I was it. just saying my son is nine right now, and I, I'm wondering what I could be doing. Uh, no, he's nine. He's only in fourth grade. Fourth grade? Sure. I bet. <laughs> What I would say is I would go back to that keys to success area and I would go back to that, that four quadrant colored chart that has all those different areas in there. And just think about the skills that any child needs to become independent and to become responsible, um, <clears throat> learning how to get around in your community exposing them to different kinds of jobs, getting them out in the community and giving back to your community, doing volunteer work, helping out neighbors. Um, almost anything you do can be considered transition and helping them to be thinking about what they like and what they don't like. Um, and talking to people about different jobs. And then what do you like about that job? What don't you like? Do you think you'd like to do that? Having them look at their interests, um, their hobbies, the things they like to do, and how might they tie those things into a job down the road um, or something they can make money with. Um, so just begin exposing them to as much as you can and thinking about developing independence and responsibility. One of the big things is feeling comfortable with your child being at home alone. 
So for example, if they're in, in high school and they're going into a work site and you and your husband and everybody else in the house works, can they leave a little bit later when you've already gone to work? Or can they come home a little bit earlier before you get there? That Those kinds of things may seem silly, but they're huge and really impact the kind of experiences a student can have um, when they actually reach transition age. So anybody else? Hi, Patricia. Um, I have a, a uh, an AT question. Um, Hold on, we've got some competition. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Wait a minute. That might be me. Me. Let me see something here. Let me close this. <laughs> I can't get out of here. I don't want to. Oh, here we go. Whoops. Let me get rid of this. There we go. Sorry about that. Okay. Somebody was starting to ask a question. Hi, Patricia. This is uh, Sharuna. I'd like to ask an ET. Uh, question. Can okay. you hear? Okay, so I have um, a junior and um, I'm trying to get the school to use or teach my kid more AT tools that he could use in a college setting um, now. And I'm having a hard time convincing them. What, what's his disability? Uh, he has autism. Okay. And do you know what kind of tools you're looking at? Does he have trouble with reading, writing, organizing, all of uh, the above? No, more organizing, uh, long-term planning of uh, assignments, uh, taking notes, that kind of stuff. Well, what I would say is, um, as I'm finding, there are a number of apps out there that can be used on, on a cell phone or on an iPad or some kind of tablet. Um, and I would start by saying if you could get a goal in his transition work around uh, executive functioning, organizing, study skills, that type of thing. And then focusing on him becoming independent at doing that. And that would apply both to the high school setting and then eventually to a, a post-secondary setting like a college setting. Um, but if he has the tools now, and it could be a, an occupational therapist that uh, might have knowledge of some of those laps, not the apps, I mean, it might be a special education teacher. So he wouldn't necessarily need an assistive technology evaluation. So you might want to focus more on what are the goals that you want him to be able to do, and then look at the technology that might make it easier for him to do that. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. It's just, uh, you know, finding, uh, finding staff that know enough of technology that is used in colleges and kind of trying to bridge that gap is, is not happening, so. Well, there are a number of places um, that, that have specialists. Some of the rest, regional education service centers have AT specialists. Um, some of the colleges have specialists. I know they do it at Southern and Southern also has an autism center. So I suspect CPAC could help you with, or CERC, Missy Wrigley at CERC could help you find some resources of people who understand both autism and technology um, and hook you up with, and there's also the NEAT Marketplace, um, which is in Hartford. So there are a number of places that could help you uh, even, borrow, I think, some of the apps or tools or software 
that uh, the student could try out in the school and the school wouldn't have to pay for it or buy it. And that may convince the school to move in that direction. Thank you. Hi, I'm going to really quickly launch a poll, and this is valuable information for us. So if you can please just um, answer the questions, just a couple of questions in the poll. Okay. Do we have any other questions? There is a question, what can, I, what can be done if a child refuses to attend school? Uh, depends on what age the child is, um, but certainly there are a number of resources in any school district where they're focusing on attendance. If you have a student who is over 18, um, you know, having a PPT and finding other options for the student might be another answer, um, but it, it is a Tricky issue, but there are a lot of people in most school districts that can help with answering those questions, but it should should go through a PPT if the student's on an IEP. Okay. And we're on the nose at seven o'clock. Any other questions? <laughs> Well, I will leave with one last thought. My uh, email address is on the front of the presentation. So if you have any quick questions or thoughts or you need help linking to a resource, you're feel, feel, feel free to email me. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. And I know there were several questions about the PowerPoint, so we will be emailing that out. And we will be, this is being recorded, so it will be also be on our YouTube channel. Okie dokie. Okay. Any last questions? Right. Okay. Well, thank you all very much. Have a good evening.